And we're going to start together and spend a couple minutes together on this. We're going to start in the same starting point we did last week. And it's Philippians 1 and 6. This time out of the Amplified Bible, it says this. I am convinced and confident. Would you guys mind reading that with me? Just th- that, that part right there. Can you do it with me? One, two, three. I am convinced and confident. Can we do it one more time just to seal it? One, two, three. I am convinced and confident confident. All right. What are we confident of? Well, hopefully this, this thing that he who began a good work in you will continue to perfect and complete it until the day of Christ Jesus, the time of his return. That's what we're hoping for in this game of life, that we can be confident, convinced and confident that God's working with us. And here, Palm Sunday, like we said, the death of Christ is still working in us to bring the life of Christ out in us, that abundant life that he wants us to have. And he wants us to get to this headspace where we can be convinced and confident that God's up to something. Would you do me a favor and would you nudge your neighbor real, real easy, just nudge your neighbor and say, God's up to something with you. God's up to something with you. All right. So, in case you missed it, in week number one, we kind of talked about stinking thinking. And we talked about David and Goliath. You can go back and you can see any of these online. But in this story, I'll just remind you that we talked a lot about headspace. And my front row uh, basketball coach right here told me that when you're playing the game of basketball, 60% of the outcome happens right up here in your head. If you go in with stinking thinking, you're probably not gonna win. And I think it works that way in life too. Your thoughts, the Bible says, as a person thinks, so he shall be. And if you remember, we talked about what voices do you hear the loudest in your head? Do you hear the voice of opposition or the voice of opportunity? Do you hear the voice of doubt or the voice of confidence because of you know who God is and what he does? The voice of the enemy or do you hear the voice of a champion? What's going on up in your headspace? The second week we talked about soul struggles and we talked about Caleb. David and Goliath the first week, Caleb uh, against a whole nation really uh, in the second week when they were about to go into the promised land. Uh, And Caleb had the confidence that if God said it, we can do it. And the Bible says that Caleb's, well, in Hebrew, Caleb's name means wholehearted, wholehearted. So that's what I mean by soul struggles, because that's your your heart, your, 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 your soul makes up not only just your thinking, but it makes up your emotions and your will. It all kind of comes together in your heart space, your head space, your heart space, and in In that, we talked about that, that Caleb, the Bible says, had a different spirit. There's normal and there's different. And so I challenged us to think about that. And maybe some of you even said, I want to have a different spirit. I want to have a different heart. I I want to follow God differently and wholeheartedly. And and we talked about that, that battle between normal likes to grumble and complain, but different speaks life. Just like that song was singing, speaking life. Normal likes to look back at everything and remember how things were, but different looks forward with expectation. Normal feels defeated by problems and different sees potential in problems. So we talked about that. And the third week, we talked about the a sinking thinking. That was last week. So from a stinking thinking to a soul struggle to a sinking thinking, And that was with Samson and Delilah. We kind of dove into that one a little bit. And we talked about Samson's struggle. He was strong on the outside, but not so strong on the inside, right? And we talked about these neural pathways in our brain, this cognitive, uh, cognitive, am I saying that right? Cognitive, there we go. Cognitive thinking uh, and behaviors, neural pathways. And your brain, every time, I'm not going to re-preach this, but you can go back and watch it. Every time you think a thought and you think it again, your brain starts wiring that way. And your brain looks like this sometimes. If you could see it, well, I went too far. Go back. 
All right, your brain kind of looks like this sometimes. Just all kinds of, when you're thinking thoughts, you think thousands and thousands of thoughts, but when you think a thought and you think it again and you think it again, you start to develop this wiring in your brain that draws you back to that way of thinking. So we really challenge like that. Here's this one more thought, one more picture of that, the way your brain wires itself. And that's why sometimes you can have a sinking thinking. They call it, again, cognitive behavior, ruts in your thinking, ruts that draw you back. You keep going back to that same way of thinking or that same behavior. And every time you do it, it gets easier to do it again. And you want to, you want to stop it, but you can't stop it. And your life moves to the current of your thoughts. So we talked about that and we talked about that sinking thinking. And we're going to talk today about weak living. Those are our four hit lists for uh, March Madness. And uh, we're going to get into this and talk about this guy. It's a weird name, Ehud. Weird, weird name, weird guy in the Bible. You may not have even ever heard of him before. Maybe some of you have. But Ehud was this unexpected hero that rose up. He was kind of, if he was ranked in numbers, you know, like those 64 teams, he would probably be down there in the 60s, right? He, he was, he, he was, you know, he wasn't what you would probably pick as your first uh, choice in any type of situation. The Bible says that Ehud was left-handed. Now, I'm not throwing any, you know, shade toward people that are lefties, you know. Uh, I think Chucky is left-handed, um, and he does all right. He's a pitcher, and, he, you know, he can pitch left-handed. I guess it works, you know. Uh, I don't know. How, how's your strikeout record, Chucky? Yeah. You strike them all out. <laughs> Ehud was a lefty, but I don't know if he was a lefty by birth. I think he had to be a lefty because if you kind of dig into this story a little bit, you'll see that he was, the, he was restricted in his right hand, restricted or hindered in his right hand. So, it means that he didn't have the full use of his right hand for some reason. Some would say it might have been a withered hand or a crippled hand. Um, he was shut with regard to his right hand or restricted with his right hand. He might have suffered an injury at some point, but for whatever reason, he didn't have use of his right hand. So he was a lefty. So you wouldn't really think of Ehud as being some sort of big hero, some sort of big, you know, battle hero. But let's look at what happens with him. I'm just going to warn you ahead of time. This story is a little weird. It's honestly a little gross. So giving you a heads up. We're going to go to Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3. Here we go, diving into this. Judges chapter 3, verse 12. Watch this. Once again... The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. Folks, this has been a reoccurring theme all month long of God's people making bad choices. And just like I said, they, 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 we can get these, these ruts in our mind, the, the, stink, the stinking thinking and the, and, the, and the sinking thinking that can turn into weak living. We may not want it to be that way, but it happens because when you think the thoughts and you think them again, you get drawn into those ruts and then you do those behaviors. The Bible says out of the heart, you bring those behaviors and, and those actions and those things lead to consequences. The good man brings good, good acts out of his heart, that he's, out of the good that he stored up in his heart. And, and at the same time, the bad, the evil, bring, we bring evil out of our heart. So, so here again, Israel just keeps doing evil. They keep going back to idol worship. They keep going back to doing the wrong thing. And God is trying to get them to change. So watch. If you were here last week, you're going to remember this. The Lord gave King Eglon of Moab control over Israel because of their evil. Remember last week we talked about the furnace 
of affliction. Sometimes God will put you in for a moment into the furnace of struggle. When you won't stop with the thinking and the behavior and the action, sometimes he will put you in the furnace for a minute to get you where you need to be, but then he will always raise up somebody to bring you out. He'll bring, he'll bring help to get you out. He's not gonna leave you in the struggle, okay? Just wanna make that clear. God sometimes will let you go through struggle to get you to a place where you're willing to change. And then his plan is to bring you out of that struggle. You with me? So, once again, the Israelites did evil. The Lord put them back in the furnace again. Looks like a Thanksgiving Day turkey. Nope, it's not done yet. It's got to cook a little bit longer. So we're going to put them under King Eglon from Moab uh, and because of their evil. So Eglon listed the Ammonites and the Amalekites as allies, and then he went out and defeated Israel, taking possession of Jericho, the city of Palm. Going ahead, verse 14. The Israelites served Eglon of Moab for 18 years. Well, that's better than last time, because last time, wasn't it 40? So they're getting better. He only had to cook them for 18 more years. Folks, I don't want to live like that, do you? Man, I don't want to have to go through the furnace of struggle in, in my entire life to get done. I, I want to eat the turkey, right? I want it to get done, right? Not overdone, but just right, right? I mean, I, I, want, I want God to get me to the right place in my life where I can experience the goodness of God the way he wants me to experience it. But sometimes it's a struggle to get there. 18 years. Verse 15 says, but when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, oh, there's that turn. What's that song we sang? I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. Sometimes that's what God's waiting for us. He'll, he'll let us keep struggling and struggling until we are ready to say, man, I don't, that, that thought process shifts and it's like, man, I'm tired of this. I want something to change. They cried out to the Lord in verse 15. When they cried out for help, the Lord raised up a rescuer to save them. And his name was Ehud, son of Gera, a left-handed man from the tribe of Benjamin. Isn't it weird how God works sometimes? Has God ever done some, some weird stuff in your life? Anybody? Anybody with me? God is weird sometimes. Like his thoughts are not my thoughts. His ways are not my ways, man. I, I, my whole life, I can be a witness for that, right? God does weird things sometimes. And when, when I think this is the way it should happen, it usually don't go that way. Because God knows something I don't, apparently. I'm probably not done cooking yet, so we can't do it that way, right? But in this situation, God, God picks the one, he picks the Florida Atlantic team, you know? I mean, he picks the one that nobody else would have put in their bracket, Right? God picks Ehud, this man who's got a, who's got a, he doesn't have use of his right hand. And, and here Israel is in bondage and, and, and he's got to raise up a rescuer to deliver them from this bondage, from this oppression, from this king. And God says, oh, I know, I'll pick, I'll pick Ehud because he, he ain't good at fighting. <laughs> he can't use his right hand. I mean, nobody would pick him. So God says, I'll, I'll use him to be the rescuer. Look at this. Let's go farther. Let's, let's go farther. The Israelites sent Ehud to deliver their tribute money to the king. All right there, y'all. Just That's the taxes, right? The tribute money, like they were in bondage. So, so the king is like, all right, Israelites, pay up. Pay up. And so, so in this story, Ehud goes to deliver the money to the king. God is up to something. Nudge your neighbor one more time. Say, God is up to something. Even when it doesn't look like he's working, God is up to something. He's up to something in your life. Even if you don't perceive it, he's up to something. So here goes Ehud with some other people to deliver the money to the king. Verse 16, so Ehud made 
Oh, he made a double-edged dagger a foot long, and he strapped it to his right thigh, keeping it hidden under his clothing. He brought the tribute money to Eglon, who was very portly. <laughs> so you get the picture. He can't use his right hand. So he makes a double-edged dagger, and he straps it to his right leg, hides it under his clothing so that he can, Right? Got the picture? Here we go. Here we go. What's up? God's up to something. And King Eglon needs to go on a diet. We're apparently seeing that in the scripture. Verse 18 of this story. After delivering the payment, Ehud started home. I know this is a lot of text, but that's okay. We're going we're to get there. After delivering the payment, Ehud started home with those who had helped carry the tribute. But when Ehud reached the stone idols near Gilgal, he turned back and he came to Eglon and said, I have a secret message for you. So the king commanded his servants, be quiet and sent them all out of the room. I got to pause for one second and ask you this question. Have you ever known that you should do something, but you struggle to do it? Or, or let me go deeper than that. Have you ever known that God wanted you to do something, but you struggled to do it? Like you knew God wanted you to do it, but, but there's this battle going on up in your head and in your heart. And you're like, I want, I know I need to do it. I need to do it, but I, oh, I'm struggling. I need to do this. I'm struggling. I think I see Ehud doing this, right? He's got, I, I made the dagger, strapped it to my leg, covered it up, taking the money to the king taking the money to the king. Here's your money, king, and I know what I'm supposed to do, but I can't do it. Chicken's out in the moment. That's what I think. He's, he's going home. And I got to believe he was probably having some thinking thinking right there. He's like, oh, I screwed up. Man, I blew it. I knew I was, so, was going to do it this time. I was going to, I was going to, and everybody was going to, it was finally going to be my moment. Nobody's ever picked me on the playground. Nobody ever wanted me on the, on the Israelite softball team. You know, nobody ever wants me, but this was going to be my moment. God told me this was going to be my moment, and I just couldn't do it. And he gets to the idols, and that was a big thing where God's, God wanted his people to worship him, to not have any idols, right? God is worthy of our worship, nothing else. And anything else that tries to compete with God becomes an idol. So he's walking, and, 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 and in his mind, he's wrestling, and all of a sudden, he sees those idols, and he's like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then we go, he marches back in, and he's like, hey, king, I got a secret message for you. Or you're going to want to hear this. The king sends everybody out of the room. And look what happens. Verse 20, I warn you, this is rated R. And I even left part of it out. Ehud walked over to Eglon, who was sitting alone in a cool upstairs room. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And as King Eglon rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand, pulled out the dagger strapped to his right thigh and plunged it into the king's belly. I won't read the part that gets really gross and yucky. You can read it for yourself. We'll jump to verse 24. After Ehud had, was gone. See, he, he leaves. He does what he needed to do and he leaves. After Ehud was gone, the king's servants returned and found the doors to the upstairs room locked. And they thought he might be using the latrine in the room, so they waited. But the king didn't come out after a long delay and he became concerned and got a key and they opened the door and they found their master dead on the floor. Verse 26, we're almost through. While the servants were waiting, Ehud escaped passing the stone idols on his way to Sarah where he arrived in the hill country of Ephraim 
And Ehud sounded a call to arms, and he led a band of Israelites down from the hills. So we got the picture. I mean, he got up, and he did it, and then he, and he escaped. He locked the door, and he ran, and he runs by the idols, and he's like, ha, ha, I did it. And he runs back, and he's like, it's time, guys. And he leads a band of warriors, and they go to get their freedom. He sounds the call to arms. Verse 28, follow me, for the Lord has given you victory over Moab, your enemy. So they followed him. They're following Ehud, guys. The one that nobody would pick. They're following him. It's his moment. One shining moment for all of you basketball fans. Is the Israelites took control of the shallow crossings of the Jordan River across from Moab, uh, preventing anyone from crossing. Verse 29, they attacked the Moabites and killed about 10,000 of their strongest, most able-bodied warriors. Not one of them escaped. So Moab was conquered by Israel that day, and there was peace in the land for 80 years. Wow. That is a story, y'all. That's a crazy story. And, and obviously, back in the Old Testament, there was lots of battles and lots of war going on. And this is, this is one of those gross stories, but you have to look past the history of it and you have to say, God, what are you saying to me out of that? And I would encourage somebody to say, just like Ehud, it ain't over for you. If people have dis discounted you, if people have overlooked you, if people have somehow thought that you weren't enough and you weren't qualified, if people passed you up when it came time to pick and choose, if you got a low ranking for some reason and, and, and you have felt like, like you've never had your moment, I'm here to tell you, it ain't over. God's not done. God is still working. He still has a moment for you. And if you will be willing to say, yes, God, I'll do what you need me to do. I'm telling you, that one shining moment can happen. God can change everything in a moment. But here's the truth. Weakness. Everyone has weaknesses. And remember, we're supposed to talk about weak living. And again, when it comes to weakness, sometimes... We feel overlooked, and it makes us feel weak. Sometimes we feel underestimated, and it makes us weak in our thinking. Sometimes it makes us feel depressed. Sometimes it makes us feel defeated. Sometimes we feel disabled, and sometimes we feel disqualified. There's your list, folks, of weaknesses. Life gets messy. But just because life gets messy doesn't mean that God isn't in it. And he doesn't mean that God has forgotten you. Doesn't mean that God isn't working. God can take weakness and work with it. Ehud was used to deliver an entire nation out of his weakness. Some probably thought he was unable, disabled, disqualified. But God thinks different. Some people might have even been cruel to him, but God thinks different. Look what? We'll jump to the New Testament for a moment. Look what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 12. Look at this real quick. To keep me, this is Paul, to keep me from becoming conceited, God put a thorn in my flesh. A messenger of Satan to torment me. In other words, God put him into some struggle, Paul said, to keep me from getting the wrong kind of thinking. Verse 8 says, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient and my power is made perfect in what? 
you got, you got to catch this. Paul's like, I don't like this. I want you to see yourself in this for a moment. Paul's like, I don't like this. God, take this away. I don't like this struggle. I don't like this furnace. That's my grandson. Put yourself in this. Where are you at? In your head space, your heart space, it turns into your life space. Where are you at in this? Paul said, I don't like this. God, take this away. God says, my grace is enough. What does grace do? Grace gives you what you don't deserve. My grace is enough. I won't get you through this, Paul. As a matter of fact, my power, my power, God says, is made perfect in weakness. Isn't it weird how we think, though, when we see weakness, we see it as something to disqualify people. Weakness. We see it as a bad thing. We see it as a negative thing. We see it as, as a disqualifier. But God says, when I see it, I see a potential. I see the potential for my power to be made perfect in this situation. Look at Ehud. He doesn't have use of his hand. People may want to discredit him. God says, I see the opportunity uh, to do something nobody would see coming. Nobody's going to expect this man with this withered hand to use his left hand to pull out a double-edged dagger and to bring freedom to my nation. Nobody's going to see that coming. God writes crazy stories like that. And what you see going on in your life right now, and you may have weakness in your life. You may have wrong thinking that leads to a wrong heart space that leads to a life space of things that you may not have ever wanted for yourself. But I'm going to tell you, it's an opportunity for God's power to work. This verse, Paul goes on to say, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I, del I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, I am strong. Talk about a different headspace. This is a different wiring in your mind. You, you, gotta, you gotta say, God, I want a renewed mind. I, I wanna start thinking different today. Because I've been thinking one way and that's been getting my heart a certain sort of way and I've been having a lot of big feelings about that and I've been doing some things and it's bringing other results that I don't want. So today, God, today, I would like to start thinking different. I'd like to get my heart space different. I'd like to see some difference in my life. As a matter of fact, God, I'm going to boast at the places that I'm weak. I'm going to huh, delight in it. Oh, yeah. You may look at this chiseled physique up here and think, oh, he's got it all going on. You may look at this perfect head and think he wouldn't even want hair up there because it would just cover up the glory of God. You just think, I don't have any, you know, he can get up there and he can talk like that because he ain't got any real problems. Oh, y'all, let's go to lunch. I'll tell you about some problems. We talk, you got three hours, you're buying. But see, I can boast in the weakness. Jose, I can boast in the weakness because that's an opportunity for God's power to show up perfectly. Where I'm not enough, God says, Hup, let me handle this. Yeah. When the insults are flying your way, when people got negative things to say about you, when people want to throw shade at you, when people want to say you can't and you'll never and you're not enough, God says, uh, don't, you just need to praise me when you hear the insults. When, when you see the weakness, you need to praise me. When, you, when you're going through the hardship, 
You, you just need to get your hands up and praise me. I love that video. I love, I love the, you guys driving in your car and your little kids, man, in the back just praising God, praising God. I, that's so cool. The, the things that are getting planted into them right now in kids' church, the thinking and the heart space and, and the scripture that's getting put into them, man, they're, they're like, and, and I know you guys like that song, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. That doesn't mean just when it's going good. That means in the hardship. That's when the insults are flying, when you didn't get the ranking that you thought, when you didn't get the promotion that you thought you deserved, when somebody overlooked you, when somebody passed you by, when somebody hurt you. It's an opportunity for the power of God to show up perfectly. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. When is then? Now. Now. Then is now. When I'm weak, I'm weak. Anybody weak? Anybody weak? I'm weak. But when I'm weak, I'm strong. Why am I strong? Because greater is he that's in me. Come on, somebody. That's good stuff right there. Huh. Weakness, weakness, weakness. Watch this. If you allow weakness to control your thoughts, your thoughts will limit your potential. I'm not trying to Dr. Phil you up here. I'm, I'm trying to Jesus you right here. The word right here. I'm telling you, if you allow weakness to demand your thoughts and your words and your actions, if you allow weakness, weak living to demand your behavior, that will limit your potential. So I come to you today to say, take your mind back. Take your mind back. People have messed with it long enough. It's time to take it back. Some people that are long gone out of your life are still messing with your mind. It's time to take it back. It's time to take it back. To say, you know what? If I keep doing what I'm doing, I'm going to keep getting what I'm getting. But maybe if I do something different, maybe if I believe something different, maybe if I speak something different, maybe if I act something different, something different will happen. Well, the Bible says this, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. Be transformed. Don't be conformed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So you got to watch out for this. A cognitive bias is a filter, a default filter based on the past. You, you know, ever know anybody to take a picture and post it on social and put a filter on it and you're like, they don't look like that. <laughs> I know them. They do not look like that. That's a filter, right? And the thing is, is that in our life, we can have bad filters, how many of you would like to just have a filter saved on your phone that makes you look worse? I look too good. Let me put my filter on there. I need to, I need to bring this down a notch or two. I don't want people thinking I'm proud. Nobody is going to buy that. Nobody wants that filter to make you look worse. So why do you want that filter in your mind? Why do you want that filter in your life, in your heart, where you see things and, and suddenly you're seeing it through this filter and you're seeing it in a way that's different than what God's seeing you? You're seeing yourself and you're your own worst enemy. You're your own worst critic. You're, you're your own worst skeptic. You're your own worst doubter. And, you, and you're constantly beating yourself down and God's trying to pick you up. He's saying, you need to trans form your thinking. It's a metamorphosis that happens. It's like, it's, like, it's like a caterpillar going into the cocoon and metamorphosing into a butterfly and coming out, right? That's what that metamorphosis, that, that transformation, that word is the same thing. It's a metamorphosis. God can do what you can't do. In your weakness, you're stuck, but with God. I got to hurry. It's about time. Pastor Cameron, you better get me out of here. I'm feeling a preach coming on. We got to get rid of those filters. We got to get rid of that stuff. It's limiting our potential with God. 
We got to take our mind back. Amen? Amen. Look, renew your mind right here. The Bible says in Philippians 4, fix your thoughts on what is true. Not what somebody said. Not what somebody did. Fix your thoughts on what is true. Who's true? God. Who's always right? God. Who never makes a mistake? God. We make plenty of them. But God is truth, and the truth will set you free. Fix your thoughts on what's true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable. Think about things that are excellent and praiseworthy. That's real intentional, guys. That's the process of rewiring your mind. Watch this. I'm going to help you. Another version of this same verse says it like this. If there's any virtue, anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Fix your thoughts. Meditate. Do you know... In, 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 in New Age worlds, like they tell you to meditate to empty your mind. I'm not telling you to empty your mind. I'm telling you to fill your mind. Fill your mind with truth. Fill your mind with what God says, with what God thinks. Fill your mind. Meditate on these things. Go ahead. Meditation, engage in mental exercise to focus one's thoughts. Man, how's this going to work? Well, tomorrow, when trouble comes looking for you, don't respond normal. Respond different. Look, you may need to take your lunch break. You may, you may need to go out to your car and just have a praise and worship moment right out there and say, God, I'm going to give you praise in this struggle because this struggle is an opportunity for you to show up and defend me. This struggle is an opportunity for you to show up and promote me. This is an, I'm, and this is an opportunity for you, God, to work in my life, to teach me something, to use me for something. David said it in the Psalms, I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I'm going to focus my thoughts. I'm going to retrain my brain. My brain. I'm going to retrain my brain. And when I retrain my brain, my heart's going to feel it too. And when I get my heart right, my heart space right, then I'm going to start acting different. He said in another text, I meditate on your words and consider what your hands have done. I want you to read that one more time with me. He says, I meditate. I roll it over in my mind. I think it, and I think it again, and I think it again. I meditate on your what? I meditate on your works. And I consider, or I think about over and over and over, what your hands have done. God, <laughs> my God, when I think of the Lord and all that he's done, this is in the middle of battle, though. This is in the middle of you having the urge to just go punch somebody in the face, right? This is in the, in the middle of the urge for you to reach back and pull out your, your, your dictionary of sailor words and just let somebody have it, right? Like, just let it fly. I mean, this is in, this is in the middle of you wanting to road rage somebody right into the ditch, right? This, this is in the middle of you wanting to pray the fleas of a thousand camels would infest somebody's body hair. I mean, this is you. You're upset. You're angry. You're going through it. It's bad. Sorry. I don't know these. It's not in my notes. I didn't mean to say the fleas of a thousand camels. I'm sorry. 
in the middle of it all, you stop the madness enough to say, God, I'm going to think on what you have done, what your hands have done, what your works have done. I'm going to think about, I'm going to think about the same God that parted the, parted the Red Sea can part this problem for me. Come on, Ronnie. Am I telling the truth? God's a way maker. The same God that raised sick people and healed them, even dead people to life, can, can show up in the midst of what's going on in my body. When I think about the Lord, he's the same God, the same God that took out Goliath, the same God that brought them into the promised land eventually, the same God that did this over and over and over again. It's the same God today that wants to show up for you. I think and I think again and I think again of the goodness of God, of his works, that he takes what the enemy meant for evil and he turns it for good. He turns it for good. God, you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You think about this this week when it gets hard. You think about that, that you can trust him. He takes what the enemy meant for evil. And even when I'm weak, even when I'm weak, he can be strong. And he can show up and turn it around. What do you need to do? Here's my what now for you. I'm praying for you right now that you will hear the word of the Lord. Identify where you're living weak. Where are you living below God's potential for you? I'm not talking about some prosperity stuff where you're like, well, I'm only in a two-bedroom house and I feel like God wants to give me a five-bedroom house. <laughs> Don't give me that junk. If God gave you a bed to sleep in, praise God, he's been good to you. If there's food in your cupboard, praise God, God's been good to you. If there's clothes on your back, God's been good to you. If there's shoes on your feet, God's been good to you. Where are you living weak? And how are you thinking weak? And then I'll tell you this, you need to meditate on God's ways and works. His ways and his works. Man, I didn't even know that there was weird stories in the Bible like Ehud and Eglon. Get in it. Get in it. And you're going to see comeback story after 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 comeback story. And when you think that it's not going to work out, you see Jesus hanging on the cross and the devil's jumping up and down saying, we did it, we did it, we did it. And he says, it's finished, it's finished. And he did with, oh, the devil of hell's throwing a party. He doesn't know. That God's gonna turn it for good. He's gonna turn it for good. He's a grave robber. Mm. Grave robber. <laughs> I, ain't go I gotta wait for Sunday to go there. I hope you're coming for Easter. And here's what I challenge you to do trade up. Trade up. Trade the best that you can do. It's not enough. Trade up for what God can do. When you're weak, he's strong. And I want to tell you, it ain't over. Would you pray with me today? God, here we are. It's been a good day, God. We've done good. We've sang good songs today, God. It's been good to have guests in the house today. And it's been good to see family in the house today, God. It's been good. It's been good, God. The sun is shining today. It's good. But God, it would be so great, so great if somebody would 
just believe right now. Just believe that there's more possible than what they're seeing right now, what they're feeling right now, what they're living in right now. There's more, God. I pray for somebody today, somebody to believe that you care and that you're able, God, to turn situations around. Today, God, I pray for somebody to believe that when they've been very, very bad and they've ran from you, God, and they've made mistakes and they've been, they've just been wrong in every way you could think of, that God, you're a, you're a saving God who, who wants to wipe their slate clean today, right now, if they would just believe. Somebody who's been living and struggling in that furnace of affliction for too long, God, that today they could just believe enough to cry out to you for help and you would send the help in their time of trouble, God. Today, God, that I can believe that somebody, somebody can experience your power, touch their life in a supernatural way today, today. Not a week from now, not two weeks from now, but today, God, that there's power in this room right now. The same God that made the planets and made the stars and made the earth and made everything in it is able to make all things new right now, today. Right now, he's able to heal of yesterday and set us free from those filters that we've been looking through life and relationships with. Set us free, God, from all this junk and these ruts in our thinking, God, to set us free from the brokenness in our hearts and the, and the consequences that we're facing, God. You're free. You've, you've come to set the captive free, God, to turn it for our good because when we're weak, you're strong. So today I pray for faith, for somebody to believe see a victory. They're going to see a victory, God. It ain't over. There is a comeback story in progress in this room. And I believe it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand with me in this place. And I'm going to ask you to take a moment before you walk out this door and respond to God. I've prayed for you. I've, I've, I've given you the best message I could today, and I've prayed over it. But now it's time for you. It's time for you. In your weakness, respond to God, and He'll be faithful. I want them to sing this chorus. I want you to know that these altars are open. If you need prayer today for anything, I will meet you right here. I promise you, I won't go anywhere. I love to say goodbye at the door, but I'm gonna wait for you here today. If there's, if there's one person I can pray with. Listen, I'm going to believe there's something to change today, all right? We got other people that are here to pray too, that we're here for you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for the story that God's writing in your life. You're going to start to see it, start to believe it.